Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, AWS Security and Compliance for Enterprises. When you join today's webinar, you selected join either by phone call or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. Also from this control panel, you will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason we could not get to your question, we plan on responding to each, to each of you personally through email and the deck will be available through SlideShare along with the recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation. So keep an eye out for that email. My name is Kevin Dobbins and I'm one of the principal security solution architects for AWS and I'll be your speaker and moderator for today's webinar. Many times we have conversations with customers and a lot of the conversations focus on why is security traditionally so hard? Um, in my role, I have a lot of conversations with customers and we look at the transition from the earlier previous on-premise data centers and how the data centers are actually set up and how sometimes the challenges of one identifying uh, our hardware and identifying servers and systems is a challenge based on the, the legacy and sometimes the age of the data centers. When you couple that with the challenge of a low degree of automation, it makes it very challenging for individuals to understand where their potential security risk may lie. And one example that I can speak to from myself in a previous role of a senior information security manager, one of the challenges I had was really the true visibility of the entire estate and some of the assets that we needed to ensure that were secure. One of the challenges would be in the morning, just trying to understand and discover if anything had actually happened the night before. And if so, what do I need to address to ensure that there's no issues associated with our confidentiality, integrity, and availability? So you can understand that I had real challenges understanding and managing infrastructure and potentially the vulnerabilities. And again, that makes it somewhat difficult to manage your risk. The second biggest challenge that I had to deal with in this particular role was a low degree of automation. When you're managing a security environment, particularly an acute environment, when you're doing things like patch management, the biggest challenge is that patch management takes a lot of time because you have to ensure that you know, these activities take place in a particular change window. And if you think about the fact that the change windows primarily are out of office hours, which could be usually in the weekend between midnight and 5 a.m., you know, this presents a challenge for the individuals who actually have to go in and perform the changes. This is where when you look at potentially automation, that this could be a potential say solution to any of the challenges where you can remove the potential risk of human error. So if you think about the traditional data center and some of the challenges it would be difficult for you to actually move fast and actually be secure. So when I've spoken to customers, they see that basically some of the challenges around moving fast and, and staying secure are fewfold. But in reality, when you think about it, it's, it's a challenge for customers really, it's the low degree of automation and the inability to respond quickly. And, and this is really where the customers really focus and, and have conversations with us in AWS as how we can help them address that. Well, one of two things that can happen is 
when you think about the the method and how you approach moving fast and staying secure you do not necessarily have to see this as a as a binary trade-off it's not that you can either move fast and there's a notion that if i go too fast i can't be secure i can stay secure and that security is there for something that requires more or less a, a plotting nature which means moving somewhat slower when you're trying to actually maintain the security posture of an organization. And therefore, it's antithetical to moving fast. We wanna challenge that notion here at AWS in the terms of treating this as a dichotomy and really thinking about this is moving fast and staying secure, that I can have great visibility and I can do it with a high degree of automation and together that allows me to do very fast innovation and deployment, as well as maintaining a security posture. One of the questions I receive from customers quite often is their concern about moving sensitive workloads into AWS. Uh, and some of my customers, they, they question the, the security aspects of AWS and are concerned if, you know, if they can ensure that their workloads can be secure in AWS, especially when we talk about some of the regulatory requirements. When customers ask me that question, my answer is, is, is yes. And a lot of times customers would like to then see customer examples of, of other customers, sometimes in their same industry vertical, that are also actually running sensitive workloads on AWS. So on the list here in front of you, there's, there's three examples of customers that have actually taken the approach to actually place sensitive workloads in AWS. So if you think of an organization like FINRA, that is an organization that's in the financial services space. ZocDoc is actually in the healthcare life sciences space, and Vodafone is actually in the telecommunications, telecommunications space. All of these are different industry verticals, but they all share the same common underlying infrastructure as being able to place sensitive data in the AWS environment. All of these companies have something in common where all of their building blocks and the, say the business strategy is based on the AWS platform. And in many cases, they're handling these very sensitive workloads. And they've noted that this is also a, a key aspect to allow them to demonstrate flexibility and agility. In addition, all of these companies basically have a, a global footprint footprint. So one of the advantages of AWS, it allowed them to actually what we call go global in minutes and still maintain their security posture. When you talk to customers, one of the things we talked about relative to our strengthening of the security postures is first, when they build on the AWS platform, they inherit the global security compliance controls. What that means is when they deploy controls and we meet compliance obligations, we do this on a global basis. So when you look at our infrastructure, when we look at compliance, customers in the US can have workloads in Europe that actually meet the same compliance requirements. So we don't take care of one environment. We don't just look at Europe and make Europe compatible with just Europe, with European law. What we do is we look across all environments. So we try to do this on a global basis and implement these controls globally. So you will see when you look at our environments that we put in place, for example, the ISO 27001 compliance, 
we do that on a global basis. When we do things in any of the other environments, we apply these controls globally to ensure our customers know that they can reliably deploy data in different environments and not lose a common control infrastructure and set common compliance requirements. The second is that we really focus on scaling with visibility and control. Remember that I talked about one of the additional tra traditional challenges with the lack of visibility. We specifically have built a massive amount of instrumentation in our platform to allow for superior visibility of what's happening in the environment. Everything from what's happening on the network interface, as well as what's happening inside the instances, and even what's happening with API access. We want to allow these controls to scale both up and down. And you might say, well, why would I want to scale down? Well, one of the things that we help customers do is scale up an environment when they feel they need additional resources. But again, we help customers understand that when those resources are no longer needed, we can scale back down. And not only does that save customers money, but from a security perspective, it also actually reduces the attack surface of an environment for the customer. And so being able to grow these environments and then shrink them back down and not lose the controls and not lose the ability to see what's happening in the environment is something that is powerful on our platform. In addition, we really maintain the higher standards for privacy and data security. We know that our customers are running very, very sensitive workloads, and we want to make sure that we would enable them to meet their privacy requirements that they are facing. And so we give them the ability to understand and meet these requirements. Whether it's helping customers deal with recently implemented GDPR or anticipating things like HIPAA, where there are privacy controls, we are here to help. What we do is we want to make sure that the customers, regardless of those different privacy rules, have the ability to do and manage in our environment. The next is that we really want to allow automation. We really like to help customers focus on automation. One of the key challenges of how we automate is we want to ensure allow for people to automate for these interactions to be able to deploy a new environment, to be able to automatically check the configuration status of deployed infrastructure, to make sure that they can automate and control responses that we want them to do in a response more or less in an environment from a, a threat or a response to a, a changed environment. So we have certain services and tools that can help identify when these take place. So to respond to a potential threat from the perimeter, or to respond to a change in the environment, this is where AWS can be of assistance. Finally, we can't do this all alone. We need you as a customer as well. And the customer, if you have challenges with actually the implementations, we have a huge partner network that is in place and we can actually help you through our marketplace, which is our software catalog and will allow you to Basically, we have access to close to 400 security partners and building offering solutions on the AWS platform. I think this is one of the most interesting sections where I have conversations with customers. Basically, one of the advantages of the AWS infrastructure is by coming into the AWS environment, you inherit the global security and compliance controls. As I mentioned earlier, if you take a look at the slide, there are a number of different security and compliance regimes and various control categories. Now, some of these are legal requirements, some of these are certifications, and some of these are compliance regimes across a variety of different industries. So you'll notice, for example, along the left-hand side, the various ISO certifications. Mm -hmm. 
We take our environments through this on an annual basis with a three-year renewal. In addition, you'll notice that we deal with requirements that are government, U.S. government, as well as international government requirements. And we want to make sure that we build those capabilities in the platform because we do not know where customers may choose to deploy services and where they would need to place their customer data. So it really doesn't matter if you are actually a filmmaker who has to fall under the MPAA or if you're a healthcare provider who needs to actually be compliant with HIPAA. We have the controls and the infrastructure that help you be a strategic part of your audit regime. We talked about scaling with visibility and control. This is often something that we want to make sure people really understand. Customers get to control where their data resides. We set up our regional infrastructure really to think about and be sensitive of the various compliance regimes that are out there that our customers have to be compliant with. And so based on that fact, we built our environments with the kind of global boundaries for data province and control. If a customer really wants to maintain their environment within the US borders, for example, we give them regions and we give them the ability to have redundancy within a region across availability zones to be able to have the environment and maintain the control within the US border. On the other hand, if they need to move the data to another area or geographical region, we want the customer to be able to do this on a global basis with limited challenges. We also give people the ability to have fine grain access controls to be able to provide authorization and access control against these environments. This can also be done at very fine grain levels with great policy detail. Customers can do this in a variety of different levels. So they may want to use managed policies or they may want to take the powerful tools of identity and access management and manage those interactions and those sets and controls their, their selves. We also wanna make sure that the environments for doing these things like using these services, for example, we have services such as systems manager or using pipeline processes to deploy automated fashions. We wanna make sure that people can integrate. We allow customers or we provide customers tools and services to integrate on premise. In addition, we have new services that were just recently launched, such as Transit Gateway. Uh, this is another service that allows customers to integrate with their on-premise environments. This is perfect for individuals that are thinking about maintaining workloads in a, in a hybrid environment. And what we want to do in AWS is allow them the ability to have control on-premise and in the cloud and allow seamless integration. This will potentially give customers the opportunity to migrate any additional workloads easier to AWS in the future. We talked about privacy, but let's see if I can take that a, a one step further. In 2018 and in 2019, we're seeing actually a number of global po uh, privacy laws that are actually coming to effect. And a variety of these affect countries in a different method. In the examples of India, Brazil, Mexico, and even the state of California, where the passage of the California Consumer Privacy Act has actually been passed, we're seeing this challenge that customers are facing in terms of being able to meet privacy requirements that they face in their industries. So it's not just small limited to an effect, it's actually becoming a bigger deal. And when you think about global businesses and actually having data in different geographical locations, this is an area that customers actually need to pay attention to and the AWS services can help them achieve some of these requirements. 
The second thing is that in most cases, there is powerful technology that exists to help avoid breaches or the inadvertent disclosure of information, and that's encryption. In AWS, security is our top priority, and we like to help customers understand that encryption is one method that they can actually ensure that sensitive workloads can be placed in AWS. We also have tools that can help customers provide encryption at scale. We at AWS want to make it easy for customers so that they don't have the challenges of managing key material or managing their own key material at scale. We're giving them the ability to do this so that they can have encryption from an end-to-end -end perspective, both in motion and in rest. We help people understand how to think about using our services to help them comply with the law. Now, we're not going to offer them legal advice, but we are going to give them the ability to understand the role that our technologies and services and patterns play for the customer perspective. Automation is something that goes to the core of AWS, and it's really something that we embrace both internally and the way that we manage our own environments. We want our customers to understand that we like to help them work at scale. So here's an example of what we might do for uh, a customer that looks like they need to have an automated threat remediation. We have a service, for example, called Guard Duty. We announced this service at reInvent 2018, sorry, 2017, and it's been a fast growing service. What this service essentially does is look at the activity that's happening against the accounts by using multiple sources from the log sources within AWS. So it takes advantage of CloudTrail, it takes advantage of the VPC flow logs, for example, and being able to take this information and compare it to the threat intelligence and identify a number of potential threats to an organization. We integrate this service and give customers the ability to integrate this service with CloudWatch in which they can set up event triggers and they can set thresholds and they can even look to see the kind of information that allows them to get the visibility of what's happening in their environment in almost near real time. But you can take it one step further. We offer services that help you create event triggers. And so for you on this familiar with Lambda, for those of you who are not familiar with Lambda, sorry, Lambda allows people to run functions as a, as a service. These could be triggered by a variety of events. These events drive the, the triggers to Lambda to kick off a series of functions that invoke remediating action without human intervention. One of the statements in, in cybersecurity is the identification as the human, as the weakest link. So in AWS, we like to help customers focus on remediation with automation. I'm gonna take a somewhat of a, of a pivot to discuss our security solutions that make up our security services portfolio. In AWS, we have a, a framework that we refer to and it's called the Cloud Adoption Framework. Now, the, the Cloud Adoption Framework provides five pillars that help customers think about the important aspects of the security services that we offer and where they would be relevant when they think about migrating workloads to AWS. This is a, a conversation I have quite often with some of the customer accounts that I deal with, and we focus on the five pillars and how we can use the AWS services underneath each pillar to help them achieve a secure environment. 
the first pillar, the one that I personally like the, the most, we like to think about identity. We want to focus on identity. This is an area basically where we're talking about understanding who can have access to resources in your environment. In this pillar, we focus on identifying the concept of least privilege. We look to set up identity and access controls, and we're trying to ensure that the right people are able to access the right resources within an environment. In addition, we want to ensure that logging is enabled so we have an audit trail to understand who is accessing what resources in our AWS environments. The next pillar, which is also a very important pillar, is detective controls. When we think about detective controls, the services listed here in this pillar are the services that help us have the visibility of what's happening in our AWS infrastructure. This helps bring the visibility that we discussed earlier in the session, helps bring this visibility into the customers to help them understand what's happening in their environments. Infrastructure security can be compared to the traditional domain of security when you think about the on-premise environments. You can think about protecting the perimeter in this aspect. You can think somewhat about firewalling. You can think about the use of access control lists or, or security groups. But in this pillar, the focus is on protecting the environment from unauthorized access. Data protection is really critical as well. And in this case, in this pillar, we want to show customers that we offer services in AWS that can be used to ensure that you are encrypting data and then that you can ensure that your data in transit or in rest is protected from unauthorized access. Lastly, incident response. This is often something that customers don't necessarily incorporate with their AWS environments to start, but it's something that we do advise customers to think about as they transition more workloads into AWS. The idea is to focus on creating an incident response plan for your cloud environments. Very often, this is a pain point for customers, and this is where we'd like to offer our assistance as AWS. Now, we don't want to assume that all your environments are going to be secure, but the reality remains that we face a situation, or customers may face a situation, where they would need to respond to a particular incident. This might not be necessarily a security incident, but it could be something related to availability, which may be equally important to the, uh, say, financial condition as a, of a company. Within AWS, we have a large ecosystem of security partners and solutions, and we have a number of leading solutions across a variety of different categories. Whether it's traditional infrastructure security, in this case, we can think firewalls, intrusion prevention, intrusion detection. These are services that actually are deployed in AWS, but are similar to the traditional on-premise data center solutions. This will allow customers who have particular services or infrastructure security on-premise and would still like to keep a particular skill set, they can actually migrate some of these services into AWS and leverage, say, their existing skill set in, for example, checkpoint firewalls or Cisco routers. We have a number of leading providers in this space. And what's great about it is that many of our customers have invested in learning these resources. And therefore, it's, it's even a 
easier transition into the AWS environment. We also offer identity and access control partners. Basically, you can think about using third party tools to help control identity and access management. This is done with some of the leading identity and access partners all the way down to protecting even multi-factor authentication. If you think, for example, vendors such as Jamalto and Jamalto tokens, this is where some of the security partners come into play. From configuration of vulnerability management, we have customers that have tools that are powerfully used to assess environments on premise. And some of these tools can actually be recreated or deployed in AWS. So again, the same still skip from the individuals on premise and the data center can actually now do this, perform the same actions in AWS. Finally, logging and monitoring, the ability to work with some really powerful security incident and event management tools. All of this is available through partners in the AWS marketplace. We have many consulting partners that we work with. Many of our customers uh, are willing to move to AWS and some of the challenges with moving additional workloads is that they, they lack some of the experience and they're looking for assistance to help migrate workloads into AWS. So we have partners that are in this space that can help customers do a variety of different things, whether it's building out architectures and the engineering that's required to secure their environments or deploying services, all the way to running their environment for them as a managed security service provider. We offer this for many of our customers that are part of the APN network to allow them to really take advantage of these trained partners, these partners that have the expert areas and expertise and great familiarity with our AWS technologies. One of the key aspects of moving workloads into AWS is for customers to understand the shared responsibility model. So in AWS, the term shared responsibility model helps customers understand that there's two aspects to security, especially in AWS. So AWS, by being the, the cloud provider, the infrastructure provider, is actually going to be responsible for the security of the cloud. So this will entail the physical access to data centers. This will entail the underlying infrastructure, everything up to the host OS. Security in the cloud is where the customer is now responsible for, you know, what they're deploying in the AWS environment. If you think about the, the software that's actually deployed on the EC2 instance, the updates associated with some of the software is the responsibility of the customer. And with AWS, we can ensure that we have certain services in place to help visibility for the customer with the idea that as a joint cooperation, as a joint ownership, both of us look at improving the security of all the workloads in AWS. When you compare the shared responsibility model to the traditional on-premise security model. If you look at the arrow to the left side of the slide, the customers are actually responsible for the end-to-end -end security of their services. This would not only be, say, the data in transit, but this would also be the systems in the data center. When you compare this to the model in AWS where the shared responsibility model sits, when you see the demarcation point where the software and everything that's higher up in the stack, the client side data, the server side data, the operating system, the platform and the customer data, this is all the responsibility of the customer in AWS. But if you compare this to the previous slide, you see where AWS has taken a lot of the heavy lifting away from securing the underlying infrastructure. 
Now I'd just like to point out a few customer examples. So if we take in the, uh, a look at, at FINRA, which falls in the financial services space, FINRA offers a regulatory service. And what's special about FINRA is they have very sensitive workloads. Uh, these workloads are actually consist of huge transactional volumes that they need to maintain. Actually, FINRA is somewhat of a smaller organization, and it's amazing how much transactional volume they actually generate as such a small organization. So not only do they need to ensure security, they also need to ensure availability. A key part of the regulated financial industry for FINRA is to ensure that you are secure. As they are built the environment on our platform, allow them to run their service in high availability and to be able to set controls in place that allow for them to have not only their own internal understanding, but their ability to demonstrate those controls externally to a variety of others. If you look at it, for example, you know we talked about it earlier, things about how you can be fast and secure. I'll call your attention to this third bullet point on the left-hand side. They were able to actually, in AWS, increase their server hardening times from three to four weeks to three to four minutes. This is a situation where they did both fast and secure by using a combination of templates as well as an automated deployment pipeline process to be able to automate that process and deploy those environments and workloads in a hardened fashion. ZocDoc is a customer that operates within the area of healthcare and information. So they're dealing with very sensitive information. Actually, what ZocDoc does is they help scheduling. Now, scheduling, to one extent, people may think it's not a medical record, but it's actually a medical record because they're capturing information which HIPAA says basically is sensitive health information. They have information, for example, on who you are, where you live, what you're coming in for, and who you're going to see. All of that is actually very sensitive information which must be protected. And what they wanted to be able to do is to run their environment with high availability. If you think about a scheduling service, you need to be able to have this service available all the time. People need to be able to leverage their service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In addition, they needed to ensure that the services that would be introduced would allow them to meet their obligations under HIPAA as a business associate of their customers. There are many other provide customers that may have services compatible with and supportive of customers meeting HIPAA obligations. And so they were able to demonstrate to their customers that they were able to inherit the control infrastructure that we had in AWS in order to meet the obligations that they had as a business associate under HIPAA. They have the visibility throughout their entire infrastructure to ensure that they have the right controls in place and the right level of encryption in place to manage their environments. Vodafone. Vodafone is a prominent player in the Italian mobile market. And with the rise in SIM transactions, the company wanted to find a way to make it easier for customers to top up using a credit or debit card. And since each SIM card contains valuable personal information, that solution needed not only be flexible, but secure. With AWS Cloud, Vodafone Italy was able to use uh, and able to allow its users to purchase credits online with strong security and compliant with the PCI DSS. With the muscle of the AWS Cloud behind it, Vodafone easily managed top-up requests through the new services as it grew to several thousand daily and spread to multiple online channels, including social media platforms.
another customer of AWS is Cisco. And today with me presenting in the webinar, we have Sujata Ramamorthy, the Senior Director, Information Security at Cisco. All right, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate the introduction and uh, the overview. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to share Cisco's journey with cloud uh, and security automation. Um, I lead cloud security practices for Cisco as an enterprise and I've been in the information security area for about a dozen years and this, this has been a phenomenal journey for us. Um, so let me take you through this uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, So, sorry, slides advanced a little too fast. Um, so if I look at sort of Cisco's environment, it's obviously been a very changing environment over the last few years. Um, as an enterprise, we continue to consume more and more services from the cloud to operate our own business. As a, a, a provider of solutions and products, uh, we continue to deliver our products from, from the cloud. Um, there are some examples on the screen there. We continue to build our own internal infrastructure using cloud operating models. So we have internal IT delivered cloud services from our private data centers and private cloud models to our internal business units. And we are leveraging public cloud infrastructure such as AWS and others. Right? So if I look at our environment, it is becoming a very cloudified environment, and, and certainly the cloud delivery models um, that our customers want to consume our products and services in, our internal consumers that different IT functions want to consume in, it's very evident given the advantages of moving to the cloud with respect to agility um, and flexibility, et cetera. And then as I look at it as a security practitioner, the change from a threat landscape perspective, that is also very evident, right? We are very much in, in, in an era where the attackers are trying to take advantage of where the users are going, where the weaknesses are. And certainly, as we see cloud adoption in the company and in the industry, I expect the attackers to go there. And we are obligated from a customer-centric standpoint in order to protect our customer data to make sure we're operating our cloud securely. And from a Cisco secure, you know, business standpoint, obviously that we're operating our business securely. So suddenly as I look at the cyber crime numbers here going from a $3 trillion business in 2015 to a $6 trillion business uh, in 2021, we certainly don't want to be part of that cyber crime and, and affect our customers and our company. So we need to approach security differently, for sure, uh, as these transitions happen. And in my mind, as I've observed the various transitions in the industry and here at Cisco, as we take these things seriously and work hard at it, I think we, in the end, emerge in a better place. Uh, I have examples of whether we moved from wire, you know, wired security to wireless. We had a, a lot of concerns. and. We solve them, and today I can say in our company, wireless security is as or better secure. As we transition from company-managed devices to BYOD, we had similar grave concerns. We worked on it, and BYOD emerged to be more secure than possibly all company-provided assets. Similarly, I can see the transition as we move to the cloud. I think the cloud providers and the cloud consumers are going to take security more seriously and are going to advance the effort such that most companies are going to be better off managing security in the cloud from the cloud than managing it themselves. So I think all of these trans transitions push us as security practitioners, but in the end, we come out doing it better than what we've done in the past. And I have the same optimism with respect to cloud. The other big transition that I see in our world is how as our users, developer community is adopting cloud, how their practices are changing. And certainly DevOps is, is, a, is a big change and transition, both in the industry and here at Cisco. And certainly as everything becomes code, infrastructure becomes code, storage becomes code, compute, et cetera, you see the power of automation, right? As, uh, as part of the continuous iteration, continuous delivery cycle, 
our engineering teams, our IT teams are trying to deliver feature and functionality quicker to market and have this feedback loop that allows them to continuously iterate on products or services. And as a security practitioner, all these old models of gating and, and reviewing don't fit this model of continuous delivery, right? So as security practitioners, we have to think about how do we adapt to this model and suddenly it is going to be the power of automation. Kevin alluded to a lot of this in terms of the speed and the scale. How do we as security practitioners move into this model and fit in with it such that we are delivering security in a more automated way and having this continuous visibility and continuous operational rigor that allows these teams to go fast without having to go through a n number of gates and review cycles and slowing them down. So that's where I see the power of where security can push the bar, and that is something we've been hard at work over the last couple of years that, that I'll speak to in the next few slides. So this is our methodology, and I call this the DevSecOps practice, which is about embedding automation in a lot of our infrastructure and DevOps workflows that allows us to become more agile, more you know, faster, and, and deliver security as code in an automated way, and build this sort of continuous visibility, continuous validation as a practice, right? Uh, a lot of the teams, as I go to them and talk to inside of Cisco, really appreciate the work we're doing in this model. Um, they feel like we're enabling them to do security better. We're giving them continuous visibility. And in their uh, approach of, hey, if things go wrong, we are, so, we're, since we're going in this continuous improvement mode, we can apply fixes faster. And so I'm holding them to that practice and going, okay, if we find issues and, and we surface it to them, um, how can you show us that you're actually fixing them faster, right? So, so again, the, the notion is not to gate as much, but provide them with a set of tools and techniques that allows them to have that continuous visibility, continuous remediation as a practice, and then hold them accountable to it, right? So that is the model we've been going through. And so for me, within our own team, we had to change the way we work, right? We had teams that have done security for a long time. They're security subject matter experts. They wrote policies, they wrote standards, they did a whole bunch of consulting. Uh, we built foundational solutions for a lot of the teams to use. In this world, we're doing it differently, right? We're having hackathons, we're having our security practitioners build, build and deliver code right along with a set of developers that sit with them and, and, and hence we're not just delivering white papers and policies and standards and practices, we're actually delivering security as code. So we've run about you know, 10 or so hackathons in the last two years uh, trying to solve different problems. Our security subject matters define the use cases. We pulled together a three-day hackathon along with our engineering teams or IT teams. We figured out how to do this in a, in a collaborative way, and then we deliver a lot of that with automation templates and code and, and build this continuous validation cycle through a tooling called Continuous Security Buddy that we've developed and iterated on over the last two years. So a little bit in terms of our uh, journey over the last two years as we started working with uh, AWS, Back in 2017, February, uh, we observed that we had about 500 uh, accounts that individuals within Cisco had created in AWS on their own um, and using Cisco email addresses. And that's when we realized, okay, it's time to do an enterprise agreement with AWS. It was also the time we were retiring uh, a dozen data centers or so inside of the company called, uh, which we called as infrastructure services. Um, and that was the time we were getting comfortable with users going to the cloud. And so we started this um, enterprise agreement process. A number of folks uh, from AWS account team helped us through that journey, helped us understand the shared responsibility model, and helped us understand the security off the cloud that Kevin was talking to in detail 
And we established a whole bunch of interlocks as part of that enterprise agreement to make sure we could do our security operations in that shared response pretty model with confidence. And that we had the relevant certifications that our customers come to expect from Cisco as we deliver our SaaS businesses that are hosted on AWS, right? Um, the second thing we did was we pulled together a hackathon. We established a set of security guardrails, and I will touch on that in my next slide. Um, we engaged AWS professional services to start our automation journey on those guardrails. Um, and then for about next few months, we transitioned those 500 or so individual accounts to be linked to a master account. This was a really a carrot and stick approach where as part of that linkage, A, they got volume discounts, B, we had them uh, deploy the CSB so we could get uh, at an enterprise level, we could get that security governance established. And so it was a, a good sort of uh, benefit to both individual teams that have their accounts on their own, as well as a corporate security team like ours uh, to manage security. We also integrated a lot of this as part of the e-store, which is our internal provisioning for uh, a lot of the IT services. We integrated CSB as part of the account provisioning there. So all these teams no longer had to run certain scripts, et cetera, on their own. They went to this DSO portal, um, they requested the AWS account, and from there on, it was automatically linked to this master account from a consolidated billing point of view. It already had the security tooling provisioned, et cetera. And from there on, we started to give them value. We started to give them that daily continuous security report so they could see for themselves where they are relative to compliance to these guardrails. And we established uh, some support chat rooms, et cetera, to help them uh, remediate issues, uh, you know, et cetera. And then for about the next year, we've been working on expanding a lot of the capabilities. What we had deployed and back in 2017 was an MVP version. We've been iterating to add more security tests, more security capabilities over time. We've been working on how do we take advantage of that in terms of really uh, making the, the network connection back into Cisco where there is hybrid use cases to make that more programmable and more nimble and agile. We've been working on a whole bunch of security automation about the, the platform in terms of uh, security automation into the CICD workflows itself. We've been working on how to enable a lot of this practice uh, on other cloud platforms that are also used at Cisco, including our private cloud platforms. So it's been a phenomenal journey over the last two years, embracing both the cloud as well as DevSecOps automation practices. So a little bit about the guardrails, the security guardrails. The hackathon that we had about two years ago, we prioritize these 10 use cases. We wanted to make sure any administration from our Cisco employees that's happening on the AWS infrastructure is tied back to Cisco uh, identity and access management, as well as multi-factor solutions. So that was to ensure anybody that left Cisco, obviously then lost, you know, would lose their access to the AWS infrastructure. That was by policy a requirement, and we wanted to make sure that we could put that into practice. We established a whole lot of things in terms of securing the infrastructure itself, in terms of giving the ability to harden based operating systems, secure administration via jump posts, et cetera, um, having visibility into the, and, and giving practices around how to establish a VPC and zoning, uh, how to set up vulnerability scanning uh, to make sure we can scan, uh, continuously scan our infrastructure for vulnerabilities enabling a whole bunch of logging, and um, Kevin touched on some of these things that AWS offers that allows us to get that cloud trail logs, VPC logs, et cetera, and write our own playbook to detect and respond to incidents, how to manage encryption keys, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these were all the guardrails that were put together uh, as part of the hackathon. We obviously gave a lot of these guardrails to the team. Um, and we knew that, yes, they were followed, but how to be validated, right? This is where we started to give them what I would call a security as code. Um, so we wrote a number of uh, cloud formation templates and provided this to the individual team 
so they could enable cross-account access for us as InfoSec auditors. That could also give us access for our security incidents response team to absorb and run analytics and playbooks on those logs, um, set appropriate password policies in compliance with Cisco's policies, tie back to the identity, as I just mentioned, enable all the vulnerability scanning, and so on and so forth, right? So these are all the things we also today, as part of the e-store provisioning, embed in that. So these teams don't have to, no longer have to run these scripts. But if there are teams through acquisitions that have come into Cisco and are in provision through our e-store, et cetera, these are scripts available to them to help us get that broader corporate visibility. And there's a whole architecture that's built on top of a lot of the services Kevin mentioned on AWS, right? So this whole architecture is based on those services. And so between the what we call as the tenant accounts, and today we have about 2,600 plus accounts that are joined to our master account that today we have visibility through this continuous security buddy. We've been releasing functionality, as I mentioned, um, over the last year or so, enhancing uh, the, the capabilities such that A, the, the, the tenants, our own Cisco tenants have the confidence and, and get the visibility every day. And, and so this has been a, a continuous journey for us in terms of really maintaining this continuous security body as an AWS account in and of itself, which is from where a lot of the Lambda functions are run to validate uh, the security posture through this audit role. We use the Amazon Kinesis analytics to uh, run our playbook on, on much of these logs. We're integrating that with our own product now called um, Southwatch Cloud. Um, we've tied back um, identity and group management as part of the identity and access management within the tenant account. So we have visibility into uh, DevOps accounts, admin accounts. Uh, you know, we discourage obviously use of root. Um, so those are all things that get shown up in their report. Um, we do our vulnerability scanning and provide a health report on a daily basis. And we have APIs into CSV that users can pull a lot of this data at their own, um, you know, based on their own needs. Um, so those are all elements we've been building over the last couple of years. This is what the health report looks like to them. Uh, we give them a grade, so based on how well they're doing and compliance to the various guardrails. So every day they get this health report for their account. And this is all based on a whole lot of checks. Today we have about 50 checks. We also uh, leverage the CIS benchmarks and, and run those on these accounts. And so this gives them a feel for where they need to drive remediation. And we have assistance for them on how to remediate as well, right, via other templates. For example, we have a template on how to tag assets. Uh, we have a template on how to set up a VPC, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are tools and techniques we've given them to make sure they can run security operations for their accounts in compliance with our corporate um, policies and guardrails. So in terms of uh, success, obviously uh, this has been, in my view, one of uh, a fairly successful program, security programs here at Cisco. In terms of driving both speed and scale, uh, what would have taken these teams to figure out on their own what are the best practices and how to automate those on their own, I would say it's gone from probably three weeks for each team to uh, a couple of you know days at most. Uh, we've scaled our adoption to, as I said, 2,600 plus accounts on AWS within a year. And uh, we do do analytics on the grades for all of these teams, and many of the offers that are in production mode and GA mode, you know, mostly stay at an A or a B grade level. And if they deviate and drift for a long time, we have the ability to go call them and say, hey, uh, these are some things you're not paying attention to, right? So that's pretty much what I wanted to share. I've got a, a, a few blogs that I've written uh, in terms of our journey that talks through this in more detail. If you're interested, so feel free to uh, take a look. So with that, I'll transition back to you, Kevin. All right, thank you, Shujatin. Now, I'm just a little bit weary of the time because normally at this moment, we would have tried to transition to the Q&A 
Uh, but looking at the time, it appears that uh, we might have to wrap up the seminar or the webinar. Um, with that being said, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. And as a reminder, you'll receive an email within the next two to three days with a link to the slides on the slide share and a recording of today's webinar. We want to thank you all very much for attending. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.